Okay, thanks everyone. I think we're going to get started. Uh, people will trickle in from the break, but let's go ahead. So thank you for joining. You're in the Tracker for Health session, if that's where you mean to be. So stick around and you're in the right spot. Uh, just to mention last, uh, our session yesterday about large scale tracker systems, I think we were quite successful at reserving uh, 25 minutes or so for discussion. We really hope to do the same today. Uh, that means for those that are online, you can be posting questions in the chat that we will get to. And for those in the audience, please plan to ask questions. Uh, we really hope that uh, we can have some discussion and we can make sure to address things that you're you're really interested in. And we have quite a good uh, panel of presenters that are going to be sharing with us from different types of settings, different levels of use of Tracker for health. Um, and hopefully we'll be addressing some of the common challenges and some of the opportunities. I'm just very briefly going to set the scene um, for some of the most often asked questions. Uh, and the, the most often asked question about Tracker, I think, is why? Why did you even make Tracker? Um, and what are you planning to do with it? So that I wanted to just put up front a little bit of what the vision is. And then hopefully in the discussion, we can we can get to more things. I just wanted to say that our understanding of the Tracker individual data model really does have a person at the center of it. It is a very generic data model, so what's at the center could be a vial of a specific vaccine, or it could be a shipment, or it could be a water well, it could be many things. But just saying at the center of the, the, the purpose for these programs is to capture what happens in a given event. And from that is generated so much of the data that as public health experts, we were always asking for and requiring and mandating. Um, I love this slide. This was created by uh, one of our health team and just showing kind of the vast array of data that are generated by a single child vaccination. And when we don't have something that is capturing the actual event, I mean, another way of looking at it is that it's not there at all in the picture. So if you're looking at all of the aggregated data, you're missing out the actual intervention, the point of care. And so we are quite interested in being able to keep that in the information picture and also reduce the burden of capturing all of this data in many different ways just for reporting purposes. When in reality, if you're able to include the actual event, if you're able to include the intervention, then that's where the data is. And from that, you can do all kinds of parsing and aggregating and cutting and combining to generate the rest of the data that are needed. So this is the driving focus behind why we have the individual data system. Uh, just another way of looking at it is saying that we recognize there are a lot of stubborn public health challenges and where they occur is where we want to be capturing data. So whether it's unmet need, loss to follow up, zero dose children, these are the things that happen at the point of intervention, at the point of care. And those are things that we really wanted to target in order to get the appropriate information. We have many years of working in, in these specific kinds of clinics. We know what we've been aiming for and building for are those clinics that have two or three health workers. They have a very busy records room. They maybe have somebody working on data with them, or maybe the clinicians themselves are the ones doing the data. They're very often the coordinating point for any community outreach or community health workers. They're the end of the supply chain. It's, it's the point where all of these systems come together and then a health intervention happens. And that's what we target. It has been at this point quite successful. We have over 90 countries that use DHS2 tracker uh, and the thousand programs that I'm referencing here are those that are government owned that they are currently using. There are many thousands of more NGOs and other institutions that are using DHS2 tracker for all kinds of purposes. So I will close with the question that always gets asked, is Tracker an EMR? Um, and I just want to lay out our vision of it and make it as clear as I possibly can. Tracker was designed for these purposes, being able to do clinical decision support, patient management, have a client health record, a patient health record that is longitudinal so that care carries over from one visit to the next, and have the programmatic data that needs to be reported. When you ask if it's an EMR, if this is what you're thinking of, then yes. 
But if you have a lot more in mind around all of the bed management, patient portals, billing, linking to insurance, all of these pieces are not really what we have built for. We're not aiming to be the system that is managing the hospital. We're not aiming to be the all-in-one comprehensive for every possible health scenario. And so in that sense, no, we are not an EMR. What is a key difference and one that we are seeing a lot of change is that from Tracker, we have always had and intend to have a link to the reporting and to the HMIS. So that, that data, yes, it's collected individually and it's used to manage patients and it's used to do follow-up, but it's aggregated so that it goes up into the report and it ends up in the HMIS. And so if you're in a country that is very heavily focused on implementing EMRs or already has EMRs, there's still another use case for Tracker for you, which is using Tracker to get data from your EMRs into the HMIS, which is still of vital importance. Doesn't matter to us if you use the app or not, you can use the data model, you can use the importing functions, but making sure that the data ends up also where it needs to be to reduce the double reporting, improve the data quality, and have much better visibility and access into to care. So with that, I will stop talking because I really want to hear from our colleagues. Our first presenter is a remote presenter. Uh, keep my annotations, hang on. Discard. I don't know what I annotated. So, sorry, we're going to just make sure that we have our presenter and our next presentation, which should be here. And I'll pull it over. Oh, that's right, because you're going to present your own screen. Right, right, right. So, you want to help me? She can go ahead and start sharing. Yes, yeah, so Elise, if you want to go ahead and share your screen now. Hello, everyone. Yes, sure. Thank you so much. I'll let you introduce yourself and your project. We're, we're very glad to have you calling in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm very privileged to uh, be here among you to I am. My name is Halis Taha Abdul-Baqi. I'm an uh, information technology management alumni from the University of Kurdistan, Hawler, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I'm very pleased to uh, be able to present my postgraduate research uh, on using DHIS2 for a very important public health uh, program that is the child immunization program known globally as the EPI. So in the coming slides, I will be talking about the area where I conducted my uh, research, about the challenges of the EPI in that area, what mechanisms I followed to uh, address some of these challenges and what results that I have achieved with their limitations, of course. So to start, uh, I am from uh, the Hoot Governorate, which is uh, the northwest of Kurdistan region of Iraq and another in the north of Iraq. It is one of four governorates that are forming the Kurdistan region. It is estimated to be 1.65 million population. However, that number would vary due to having a measurable uh, number of Syrian refugees and internally displaced persons from other parts of Iraq. In general, the Kurdistan uh, population and including the whole governorate is considered a young population according to the latest national uh, report uh, and official report the children under five years represent 12.2% of the population. That's having um, a healthy society or population means having well immunized children. However, unfortunately, the immunization coverage rate has been fluctuating. As you can see from the slide, I have used the DTP1 to DTP3 global per, uh, indicator for immunization program performance and the dropout rate as you can see we're two percent at uh, 2022 in the Hook governor rate where i targeted my research and then moved to seven percent last year these numbers although they are below the accepted global rate which is for dropout uh, children which is ten percent however these numbers are not, not just the result of the routine immunization services, but rather it is it includes also the extra outreach campaigns that have been conducted. 
So with the extra outreach campaigns and the routine service, we still have a high dropout rate. From there, I conducted a baseline survey before starting my research to understand more about the dropout issue. And I found out, as you can see, this is a picture from one of the PHC I visited, which is a primary health center with a vaccination unit. They have a lot of, of registries to follow, and the system is yet paper-based, and it's a national system. So it's followed all over Iraq, including the Kurdistan region. And the problems were, can be categorized into two categories. The first category is system related, and the second one is parents' behavior related. The system related is, as most of you would know, it is due to the paper base. It is uh, difficult for the health staff to identify and track dropout children. And there is no me reminding mechanism for the parents to remind them about their uh, child vaccination schedule or due date. On the other hand, for the parents' behavior, parents tend to uh, either forget the, the vaccination schedule of their children or forget to bring uh, the vaccination booklet that is given for the child at the first visit, where they can register the, where the health worker registered the child information and the dates for the vaccines. So they forget to bring the booklet or lose it don't come or even do some other thing, which is visiting a different health unit when visiting the child for the next time. So this can cause a confusion for the health staff, whether this child have been vaccinated or not and where. For the past decade, since 2011, the governments of Iraq and KRI have been trying and having initiatives with the help of UN agencies most importantly, the WHO, in uh, trying to digitizing health information and health services. And most importantly, the recognition of DHIS2 as a possible solution to transition from the paper-based health information into a digitized was uh, recommended at the comprehensive assessment of HIS in 2019 by both ministries of health in Kurdistan and Iraq and WHO. From this, the objective of my research have been concluded to have first identify the first the workload and workflow of, of the health staff in identifying dropout children and their willingness of applying an electronic immunization registry. Then to develop an immu electronic immunization registry using DHIS2 tracker and using SMS reminders uh, to evaluate whether actually this EAR and SMS reminders would be a possible solution for these challenges. To, uh, to achieve these objectives, my methodology had three steps. The first step was to conduct a quantitative survey targeting all health uh, vaccination units in the Hook uh, Governorate to identify the challenges of health staff in, most precisely in identifying the time they spent in registering, tracking, and identifying dropout children. And from the out, uh, outputs or uh, results of this survey, I tried to design a DHIS2 EAR using tracker module that can combine both the official records and the needs of the health staff from the questionnaire that I conducted earlier. As you can see, I don't know if the pictures are really um, uh, visible well, but this is the, the DHIS2 tracker. That's the, the system, the data elements of your thing. And this is how it goes. It's nothing new to you, I presume. Uh, the third step after I designed the EAR was to do a quasi-experimental study. The quasi-experimental study targeted two groups, intervention group and a control group. The intervention group targeted under one children, under one year old children, who are um, eligible for the PENTA-1 to PENTA-3 vaccine that is given between the age of two to six months, according to the National Policy of Immunization and uh, uh, being their parents to be sent SMS reminders in uh, three SMS reminders, one, one day before the due date 
and two other SMS reminders at 14 days and one month after the due date, according again to the national policy. For the control group, they were the same uh, uh, target population under one for Penta 1 and to Penta 3, but they were uh, using the same system routine immunization, no DHIS2, or no SMS reminders. The key outcome measures were to find out the Penta 1 to Penta 3 dropout rate, and then the on-time vaccination, and the delay of more than 30 days, which is considered a dropout in this case. The results showed from the quantitative survey that the challenges of the paper-based immunization registry, that 18.5% of the participants or health staff were spending more than 35 hours a month just registering a child in the daily immunization registry, then transferring all of this information into another registry called the permanent immunization registry. 48.1 of them mentioned the that the parents usually forget their vaccination, their children vaccination appointments. More than 50% found it very difficult to identify dropout children. And 61.7 mentioned really happy to apply an electronic immunization registry uh, if possible. The most important thing that, that the persons who mentioned that it is difficult to identify dropout children also have about 42% of them mentioned spending more than one hour tracking and identifying a single child within the pile of paper record. And that is a lot. This number has been drastically in decreased into less than one minute from the results of the intervention group, the group that has used the DHIS2 tracker. Due, because of the overdue report, uh, events reports, this, the identification of dropout children has been really easy, only two clicks. And instead of finding a single child, we are finding lists of dropout children. So that's quite an achievement. Also, after applying the DHIS2 tracker, we at EAR, for uh, the percentage of dropout children was 5.7 compared to 29.7 among the control group who were using the routine vaccination services. 40.2% were on time for the Penta2 vaccine in the intervention group compared to 14.6 in the control group which is also a very good indicator. And also the 3.3 delay of more than 30 days is a quiet low in the intervention group for the Penta-3 vaccine compared to the 29.2 in the control group. So as you can see, the, this is the dashboard that I used. You can see here are the reports that are generated, different types, charts, and the map shows the two yellow areas are the yellow, the areas that I targeted for the intervention and for the intervention and control groups, where they are really finding as very low. And from that, I can conclude to say that using the DHIS2 tracker has really significantly decreased the dropout rate and vaccination, improved the vaccination timeliness, has decreased the time and effort spent in identifying dropout children, improved vaccination workflow, and most importantly, it proposed an automated individual-based calculation for dropout children. That means no child will be lost for between primary health centers and vaccination units, whether who has been vaccinated where. Because of DHIS2 tracker and the, this calculation made it possible that we track one by one and we know where did they get their vaccination. That's, it really made it very uh, effective and efficient. The only limitation that I faced during the implementation and conducting the research was the SMS configuration. I use bulk SMS and I linked it to the DHIS2 tracker through in, uh, configuring the gateway. However, uh, the messages that were sent uh, did not support the Kurdish language. And the Kurdish language is the local language of the Kurdistan region and uh, it is also an official language in Iraq. So um, it has to be there to be effective. 
Because of that, I tried another local company and I tried to link the widget of the SMS um, in the uh, tracker interface. Uh, but unfortunately, that widget allowed for a very limited number of characters. And since Kurdish language use Unicode, it requires more. And so the message that was sent through the widget was not really informative enough. So uh, that was a real uh, problem for me in, in uh, at achieving my results. But at the end, overall, it, the, as you can see, the results were really impressive. And so I recommend, although it is worth to mention that WHO currently is introducing DHIS2, only the aggregate module for, uh, for health and immunization services. But in my opinion, and after I uh, did a research on it and implemented myself, I believe the tracker module is the most suitable solution and the one that can really apply to the challenges and needs of the health staff especially after finding the uh, individual-based calculation of dropout rate. At the end, I would like really, really to thank the community of practice of DHIS2, every single one of you, thank you very much. You have, didn't know much about DHIS2, you really were there and supported a lot. That is a really robust community, I must say. Most Specifically, I would like to thank Mr. Sharfet Dina Gassam for always being there. And mostly for Mr. Tito Kipkurgat. I hope I mentioned the name I spelled it right. DHIS2 server support for making it possible for me to set up the DHIS2 and to tackle all the problems that happens in production. Thank you so much for having me. And please don't hesitate to contact me for any further information. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So I I did want to pause here. The next three presentations will group, but I wanted to pause here for questions, especially because it's our online participant. I didn't want them lost. So feel free to raise your hands and I'll come to you with a microphone. I was just going to ask one to start us off, which is now that you have done this, have you had uh, conversations with the Ministry of Health? Are there any intentions to adopt this further? Uh, as a matter of fact, no, I have not yet done that. Um, the Ministry of uh, Health are really keen in Kurdistan region, at least the one that I know of, uh, are really keen to, to develop uh, the immunization system. Uh, however, since the immunization system is a national system, so any changes and any development has to come from the Ministry of Health in Baghdad. And uh, so far, as I mentioned, WHO and the Ministry of Health of Baghdad are using the aggregate module. Um, so no, so far, there's nothing on that regard. So I was going to ask uh, one colleague that has worked with the Ministry of Health in Baghdad, just if you can give us an update, do you know what the status is of DHS2 and who's supporting? Is Sela in the room? Sulema, okay, he left. Anyways. So thank you very much for your presentation. I'm working here at the HISP Center at the University of Oslo. Uh, it was a really, really nice presentation. I appreciate that. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> we've been working uh, with uh, the WHO in Iraq. We were there a couple of years ago, and I know there's been lots of things happening. So just to say that it would be great to keep in contact and link, link you with them, if not. And I also have a colleague here working with Arabic-speaking countries. So Mohammed can also say a few words. Halaz, <laughs> shukran. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mumtaz, um, perfect, really, presentation, and it's uh, really nice to see a quasi-experimental study on utilizing DHIS2, and hopefully you see the what have been published by the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and University of Oslo, uh, several trials on uh, utilizing the SMS uh, effect on improving the antenatal care uh, attendance, uh, just I would like to refer you to, to these uh, resources. It's very uh, useful, really clinical, uh, uh, randomized uh, control trial. Another thing that uh, really I uh, uh, I have just one question about the content of the SMS because it's 160 characters. So did you uh, design the content in a way that encourage or nudge the um, uh, the the, the the people to, to read it in a positive way. So did you consider this part of your research? 
and thank you very much. Shukran. Well, Zor Spas. Um, so, as a matter of fact, I did uh, uh, send the, the message uh, in two languages. One in Kurdish language, which, as I said, it's the national or the local language in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And the other one in Arabic, uh, which uh, was uh, intended for the IDPs and Syrian refugees who are living in uh, the governorate. So um, the messages were in the name of the child. So like, uh, good day, uh, you, your child with the name uh, has the vaccination, upcoming vaccination due date on this date at this health facility. So it was very short. But as I said before, the Arabic language was not a problem. The problem was with the Kurdish language. And the Kurdish language had more targeted group than the Arabic in my area, at least. So um, that, that was a problem. Using the Unicode, it was really, uh, it was really uh, impossible to get uh, enough. I was designing the, the message, and uh, I forgot to talk that uh, there is uh, another person from the SMS in uh, in uh, DHIS2 named Zubair. I'm sorry, I don't recall the last name. He was helping me on that as well. And we couldn't uh, get into a final solution for it at that time. Maybe now they do, I don't know. But at that time when I conducted it, which is last year, um, this wasn't a possibility. So we had a lot of a problem in actually writing an informative and motivating message to, to the parents. I don't know if this would be for you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gülşat Alibirgenova. I'm from the UNDP Global Fund Partnership Team. Alice, thank you very much for both your great research and excellent presentation. Very convincing results. Um, as far as I know, Iraq is one of the countries receiving support from Gavi, from the Global Alliance for Vaccinations and Immunization. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gary also invest in system strengthening. So it seems to me it would be worthwhile bringing the results of this study to the attention of UNICEF and WHO, both of whom collaborate, they are sort of partners of Gavi in the, at the country level. Yeah, uh, I think it's really, really seems like a no brainer, you know, to at least do yeah. this start doing uh, this initiative thank you uh, thank you thank you Zorspas. Uh, thank you very much i'm trying now to actually publish the results of my research in one of the international journals i'm in the process yet really of the uh, of a good global sound uh, to be applied uh, I do believe that uh, the things that I achieved with uh, my supervisor and, my, and all the colleagues that helped from DHIS2 definitely have really encouraged me to move forward into this and look forward into it, especially after I saw the results. So, um, yes, I would welcome any, uh, any links with, with Gavi and others. Uh, I do know that UNICEF do really like to move forward with this, but then... Uh, having WHO working on DHIS2, I don't know how does this work, but um, I would welcome any cooperation, definitely. And it's worth it for the sake of the population. Great. Thank you so much. We're we're going to move on now, but of course, you're welcome to stay on and, and ask uh, questions also of the participants. And Thank then you. if you see any questions that pop up in the comments uh, that you can address, please feel free to. Um, so Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we're moving on now to uh, learning more about some work that's been going on in Somalia, also with uh, immunizations, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you. And as I said, we'll try to squeeze the next three in in about 20, 25 minutes, because we really then want to have more discussion at the end. So we'll we'll do our best. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to just give the experience on behalf of uh, Ismail Kolen, uh, who is also uh, working under his Tanzania um, on uh, Somalia's future. 
uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, DHS2 enabled uh, uh, tracker uh, on the uh, electronic immunization registry. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, the overview uh, that uh, the way how it has been, uh, Somalia has been actually using the uh, paper-based tool uh, to kind of uh, uh, track and come up with the, uh, with the data. Uh, they also adapted uh, DHS2, but uh, uh, based on the aggregate. So uh, they have been correcting aggregate by actually using the paper tool and then at the end of the month, be able to uh to to be able to enter the uh aggregate data to the to the dhs2 uh which at some point uh posed the challenge as they have been uh highlighted there uh sometimes it was hard uh to kind of be able to uh because of the mix up of the of the paper tool uh to be able to know the uh, new client but also the defaulters and including also the dropout uh, zero doses uh, in terms of tracking uh those who have been missing some of the vaccination uh, also, uh, other uh, other challenge like uh, knowing those who have been under immunized, uh, which they have not completed all of their doses, but also knowing the uh, coverage status. So uh, the joint effort has to be met, where uh, it included the WHO Somalia, uh, but also the Fidel uh, Minister of uh, Somalia, uh, as well as the His Tanzania. Uh, coming up with the uh, digital uh, a way of uh, digitalizing uh, the whole process of uh, immunization uh, registry. So uh, the purpose will specifically uh, register and track the immunization of children, but also enhance the data uh, data reporting, uh, but also bypass that the manual uh, manual process of uh, of aggregating data and then at the end of the month uh, being able to uh, capture them through. Uh, HMIs, DHS2 HMIs. So uh, the methodology uh, used, um, first we conducted the readiness assessment. Uh, this readiness assessment was kind of uh, knowing the situation, if they are really able to kind of uh, uh, adapt this tracker implementation, uh, by also uh, assessing the capability of the server infrastructure they are having, the availability of power, uh, networks and all of that, uh, but also other uh, methodology that we used, we adapted the WHO toolkit, standard, uh, the metadata package. So we started with the uh, 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 stand, uh, metadata package and we started customizing it to fit the context of the Somalia uh, context. And then we, uh, through that, uh, we have to go through uh, design uh, to see what they are not applicable to them, those are that are applicable to them. And then we uh, mimicking uh, with the, uh, the data collection tool that they are having. So uh, through that also, uh, we have to configure the SMS uh, that can help them in terms of uh, uh, sending the reminders as we have seen to the uh, uh, first presenter. Uh, that could help them like reminding of the next doses for their parent to bring their, uh, their, their kids or children to, uh, to be vaccinated. But also another thing that uh, we, we, we actually uh, did was capacitating the teams, including the national level uh, up to the uh, up to the other sub-national level and even the healthcare workers who will actually be working on this uh, uh, tracker uh, in collecting the data. So this was the architecture, the way how it was being modeled. As you can see, we have uh, uh, the routine uh, DHS2 HMIS, uh, which actually uh, capture data or the actual inter data at the end of the uh, of the month. And then we have to introduce uh, this um tracker, uh the 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 uh, uh the immunization registry tracker uh which is kind of uh, capturing data the individual uh, data and then we, at the end of the month uh since we have to do this uh, what you call the aggregate data exchange uh taking the data from the tracker and then push it to the uh, routine uh, DHS2 uh, HMS, which is uh, actually capturing data at the end of the uh, of the month. But also, another thing apart from that was to have like uh, 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 
being able to support because uh, the facilities that are we used to uh, that are actually using the tracker some of them are found in the urban but other are in the remote uh, but as we all know in the remote is sometimes hard to always be connected so we have to adapt to the use of uh, uh, Android application, which is also based on uh, based on the DHS2 to, to be able to capture data and then be able to sync uh, to the web based and then uh, at the end of the, ma uh, the month, I will get those data uh, to the national uh, HMIS. But also uh, setting up the reminders to make sure that uh, uh, during the first, when uh, they are being given the first dog, they just also the uh, the message that they are received, but also informing when they should also come back for the next vaccination. So that helped them like uh, knowing when they should be able to, to come back. And uh, before three days uh, of the vaccination, they also received the reminder that uh, in the three days, you are supposed to bring your kid for the, uh, for the vaccination. So after doing that, so this was the way how it has been uh, designed. As I said, uh, we actually adapted the WHO uh, metadata package and then tried to customize around that to make sure that uh, we are actually uh, uh, suiting uh, what the Somalia want, including some of the uh, variables that we are not there in the metadata, but also removing those that are not necessary for uh, Somalia uh, use case. So in terms of the Android, so some of them are actually use Android in terms of uh, capturing uh, tracker uh, or immunization information and then synchronize it to the central database. Uh, but as I said, this uh, immunization images is a separate uh, tracker, uh, tracker DHS2 instance, which at the end of the month has to push the aggregate data to the national, to the national data. So this is one of the analytical output uh, to some of the uh, uh, to the data that has been captured specifically for this immunization uh, register, as you can see. As of, as of now, you can see that uh, uh, the capturing of the data is actually ongoing. They are actually doing it, and this reminder, the SMS uh, reminder is actually uh, being, uh, being sent to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the parents before they come for the uh, next uh, vaccination. Uh, but uh, what you have done for here, we used the local uh, telecom company to be able to set the SMS configuration to make sure that uh, uh, they can also be able to uh, to get this element. So after getting all the data captured and then stored in a central database, they can be able to have this uh, uh, monitoring dashboard that uh, help them to know where they are actually are and be able to identify those dropout and even uh, be able to trace and then it was really nice uh, for the next uh, uh, line listing that has been uh, released uh, in the, the previous, uh, in, in the last, in a couple of, uh, I think this last month, that you can be able to, uh, to be able to, to trace or have the line list that can help you to, to trace those who have been missing the, uh, the vaccination. So in terms of uh, what has been achieved so far, the results, yeah, of course, it has improved the uh, current immunization status tracking, uh, as you can see from the previous dashboard, that uh, the coverage is almost somewhere far, uh, eight something percent. So that was the purpose of uh, having this tracker, uh, immun uh, tracker uh, for electronic immunization registry being uh, implemented uh, for Somalia, uh, but also better uh, environment for proper current retrieving. Uh, and the timely data uh, data reporting because as they are going on, as they are vaccinating, they also capture data on time so that uh, through that there's no need of waiting until uh, last month to have them consolidated and then captured through the uh, through the DHS too. So uh, another advantage is to have these automated reminders uh, that help uh, informing the uh, the parents of their schedule that they are supposed to bring kids for the. Uh, for the uh, for the vaccination, thank you uh, for listening. Great, thank you so much. And we'll just move along quickly. Our next uh, presenter is presenting about uh, a broader use of tracker across several programs in the Maldives.
Uh, hello. Uh, I hope I am not too short <laughs> to say my face, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. So my name is uh, Lubana. Okay, thank you. Uh, I work as a public uh, program officer in Ministry of Health. Uh, I am going to talk about the integrated approach for deploying DHS2 tracker in Maldives. Uh, we have eight DHIS2 based integrated public health information systems. Uh, I would like to highlight that in a very short period of time, we were able to have a very good progress in developing these modules. Uh, currently, uh, uh, electric immunization registry has been implemented and currently in use throughout the country. And primary healthcare registry we have piloted in one at all, and it, it is, has been expanded expanded and implemented currently in two other atolls. And in this year, we'll be expanding it further to seven atolls. Uh, the National Cancer Registry is uh, implemented and currently used in uh, only in hospitals in central level only. Uh, we had an outbreak of uh, filariasis this year. With that, we developed the filarias, uh, lymphatic filariasis surveillance system, where we will be tracking uh, mass screening for filaria. Uh, we have piloted uh, communicable disease surveillance uh, where all the notifiable communicable diseases is uh, notified through the DS2 system. Uh, recently, last month, we have uh, piloted in one at all. Uh, we are in progress of piloting uh, other three modules, which is uh, maternal health module, growth and development module, and the tuberculosis uh, screening module. Uh, I would like to highlight that uh, for now, uh, DS2, DHIS2 system has been only used in uh, Ministry of Health, but uh, this week uh, we are in discussion with the Ministry of Social Development, where they they will be in uh, their system will be integrated with DHIS2, where uh, in the growth and development module they will be. Uh, using the DHS2 data for early identification of disabilities in children. Uh, in the electronic immunization registry, uh, we were able to record 90% uh, of all children born, born in Maldives in 2023. And we are currently doing a data audit for uh, 2023 and 2024 births. Uh, when it comes to primary health care registry, uh, we have uh, this this performance uh, here is actually of far photo where we have impaired uh, 20, uh, sorry, 94 percent of the uh, population. Actually, for the primary health care registry, we are impairing uh, population above 18 years for now, and in, in which we were able to do the initial assessment in uh, of 97 percent or 98 percent. Actually, the primary health care registry is uh, focused only for non communicable diseases right now, but we will be integrating with the maternal health and other modules in the future. So in here, the we will be tracking each individual data where the impairment or the registration is done, where the initial initial assessment is done and the follow-up started. So in far better where we piloted this year, last year, we are able to do the follow-ups now also using the tracker system. The National uh, Cancer Registry is a hospital-based registry where the cancer patients' uh, type of disease and treatment uh, and uh, diagnosis dates are entered. But with the integration with the uh, PSA registry, we'll be able to know the risk behavior. For example, uh, if a patient with lung cancer, the healthcare worker in a facility would like to know the risk behaviors, whether he is a smoker or not in the past. So actually, the integration with the pr primary healthcare uh, registry in DHS2, if the patient is imperiled in the registry, we'll be able to see the risk behaviors also uh, of the patient even though the patient is cancer. And the lymphatic filaria surveillance is used for the screening, and we are using this uh, lymphatic filaria surveillance module in the central level currently for the screening of locals for filaria. 
Uh, I think for the past two days, we have been talking about the challenges and limitations with the capacity building in terms of uh, uh, the high turn turnover and the difficulties in logistics in personally going and training people. So we have this one page uh, uh, user guide uh, that we use easily. We disseminate it because in models also with the, the uh, geographical distribution, it, it's difficult for us the central team to go to each at all or island level to uh, guide and train them. So what we do is we disseminate the user guide where each page has one step-by-step uh, -step information. For example, how to log into the system, how to empanel a patient, how to enter diagnosis. So these uh, user guides are very helpful for us in uh, training. Also, I would like to highlight that uh, we are encouraging our uh, we are encouraging our trainers for peer training. Uh, we are practicing also that in Maldives, where uh, now Farfetto has completed training. Actually, for the after the electronic immunization registry, all our health workers in in each island there will be minimum one healthcare worker who is uh, actually trained to DHIS2. So, and with expanding of different modules, uh, they they are in house training the others also for the other modules. And uh, with the cancer registry also, we started with one central hospital, and once the back uh, we have been entering the backlog data also to the cancer registry, which is from 2019. So once our hospital, one hospital have completed the data entry, the team in that hospital went to the next hospital and teach them how to enter data. And they were there involved for the first few patients for registration and data entry. So we encourage and we are uh, practicing that in the ATO level also, where each ATO uh, in island level, they are uh, training each other. So uh, I would like to thank, uh, we have so many technical partners who has who are helping to develop the these systems and uh, uh, WHO, HIP, Sri Lanka, UNICEF, UF, UNFPA, and the ADB funds we are using for capacity building and development of these modules. Thank you. I hope I am not too fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, we have one more presentation, and, and it looks for sure like we'll have time for discussion. So that's great. So I'll invite Mohammed to come join us. He'll be presenting on behalf of the HISP Middle East and Northern Africa, one of our newer HISPs. Although Mohammed and I have worked together on DHS2 for 10 years, so he is not new. All right. This is Mohammed. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for having me for this uh, time. Okay, I will focus on some practical examples on the uh, real use cases from the field and some lesson learned when it comes to, to the uh, tracker, because you know the the it's very demanding now in the region. Uh, not on the region, all countries now are uh, talking about the tracker and compare it to the MR, EHR, etc. So I will reflect on 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 some some issues. So this is the thing that I started with Ministry of Health uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. So before talking about the tracker or uh, integration or interoperability, so you have to ask your, yeah the question: Where are you standing now? So there are five level based on the national e strategy toolkit which is the, uh, developed by uh, world health organization so some countries as you see here in the yellow um uh, the experimentation or if the country in the early adoption or uh, developing and building or scaling up or mainstreaming so if the country are mainstreaming so they can use artificial intelligence and big data if the country is still in experimentation and early adoption, so we cannot talking about the integration and interoperability. Still, even the governance not there. So we have to know where we are standing now before moving to the next level. 
So this is one of the important things before adopting any data model system within the DHIS2, either the aggregate model, event model, or tracker model. So to know the context and the country um, um, resources as well. Another thing that this is a classification of digital intervention of services and applications in health. This is very important document. I would refer everyone working on e in e health industry or digital uh, health industry or digital transformation, because this is the most important thing where the terms are mixed, where the things are used in interchangeable way. So it's very important to know what is the main health system challenges and what type of application could solve this problem and how to adopt the certain package for that. So if I know that type of taxonomy and the classifications, so I can plan properly my resources because you know, we are living in low and middle income country. We don't have enough resources. Even some countries, they don't have a salary to pay for the ICT staff the priority for the doctor and nurses say so in this case we have to develop a model of data that is really relevant to their uh, uh, resources and uh, context so this is a full document contains all type of interventions and even it's very useful for the research so when it comes to the research and use the exact term and literature when you need to publish anything related to HIS or e-health, you can use this uh, document uh, as well. So here just um, the top frequently asked the questions on the tracker. So when it comes to the tracker, uh, you know, if you split one elephant into two elephants, uh, so you will not have two elements, elephants, okay? So it's, it's only one elephant. It's big or small, it's one. So, uh, here, uh, what we received at the beginning, asking about the KPIs, individual record analysis, the risk factor, the social determinant of health to be linked with the profile of the patient, notification and alerting care providers, where this patient has an emergency, please go for the room number seven and provide the uh, PCR, et cetera. So all these questions come when it comes to introducing the uh, tracker. Uh, decision support system, uh, transactional stock management, finance, accounting, ERP, interoperability, portal, personal record, machine integration, billing. So at the beginning, at the beginning, we we, we they started with this big question. It's a big ask. Really, it's a big ask at the beginning. So we cannot يعني, ask a question how to sleep eight hours in one hour. Uh, okay. All of us, we need that, but we, we, we couldn't do, the, do that in a proper way. So this leads us to think more when we adopt the tracker. I don't say that it's very complex. No, it's very easy uh, when it comes to the technicalities, to the, um, to the implementation, to the configuration, because everything in the DHIS2 uh, is already hosted, published, and disseminated in very proper way on the website, but the, the, the issue is to avoid billing the silos uh, systems here and there, then ask the team, okay, please integrate it. So from the day one, I can take some steps uh, uh, backward and looking for the future uh, and look how many program we have, how many tracker program we need, how to build it in a proper way, how to design the server capacity in a proper way, to, to avoid the availability of, or high availability of, of, of server. Here are just some, some examples uh, in our region. This is a real project that now we have. On the BHC services level uh, with Egypt, we have uh, now uh, already at the beginning of the war on Gaza, uh, we developed a tracker for all injured patients who are treated now in uh, Egyptian hospital. Until now, the Ministry of Health in Egypt adopted the tracker we developed uh, in, in, in Haspina. Uh, so, uh, in, in, and the Sudanese refugee as well, uh, who are now available in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, they, they utilize it for the nutrition. Um, uh, and the BHC services, they have more than uh, 40 health services need to be digitalized 
on the tracker in Egypt for 5,000 clinics. We didn't start it yet with, uh, with that project, but we are preparing for the, 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 the project. Uh, for the surveillance system we have in Jordan, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and uh, uh, Syria, it's repeated twice, and Palestine, uh, about the TB and HIV tracker. So the TB and HIV tracker will be implemented uh, uh, this year also in, in, in these six countries. Evaluation tool. We utilize the tracker not only for the patient. So as you see, the first example on BHC services, the second example on surveillance, the third example on evaluation tool. There is an evaluation tool that evaluates the facility itself and to rank the facility. So uh, we are tracking facility, not patient, based on the uh, water, sanitation, etc. So the country will have at the end a planning tool to know the status of this uh, facility. And for surveillance, again, in, in Palestine, as I mentioned, in Gaza, patients, and uh, sexual reproductive health with the UNFBA, uh, since you know now the situation in Gaza, uh, um, there is no any agency are able to generate one figure that count how many pregnant women now in Gaza, how many mothers in antenatal or postnatal in in in, uh, in Gaza, as and you as you know, uh, forty thousand uh, uh, Palestinian killed in, in 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 Gaza. Most of them kids and women. So uh, this is you now we we develop a dashboard for that. And uh, now we 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 have in the pipeline uh, with no Norwalk. Just uh, we start a discussion about the orthopedic surgery tracker and um, uh, health facility profile with the Palestinian National Institute of Public Health. Health facility profile tracking facility, not individual. So we are talk we give example now on patients, on facility, on resources, not only patient and people. And uh, in Palestine, there is uh, what is called family health record. It's like yani, it's a light EMR or light EHR, but I, I don't mean EMR with, with billing, et cetera, but at least with full connected um, uh, uh, programs together. And uh, finally, regional observatory with EMRO, just we, we are now discussed the ability of building early warn alert and response network system, which is include IDSR integrated disease surveillance system and CBS case-based surveillance system, where the country can see the any notification on the outbreak, high prevalence or, or incidence on any uh, disease. Finally, okay, this is the situation. We need to be to hurry up but the situation. It, it's not like this, okay? Even if you are fast, if you are agile, but this is not the situation okay? when it comes to the implementation. This is the, the take home message from implementation of a tracker because the whole session on, in, on a tracker. So, uh, the first thing countries should understand what is what is the meaning of self-adopted technology. DHIS2 really is self-adopted technology. It's not like a, a, a company that uh, uh, sell it for people or it's like a ready-made product. You take it from the shelf. So as long as, as a Ministry of Health, you adopt it, so you have to understand what, what is the impact of that? What is the consequences of that? What is the requirement? What is the, govern the governance needed? Uh, because some countries, they adopted the DHIS2, utilizing a tracker, then uh, blaming University of Oslo or anyone. The system does not do one, two, three, four, five. No, the system do if you do the design in a proper way. So from the day one, you have, if, if you are in, 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 a, in, in a position to promote for the DHIS2 or to implement the DHIS2 or to adopt the DHIS2 to understand this term, because there is an, uh, uh, some preparation. If you, that, if you do that in a proper way, so you will definitely have a success story in that. Governance, because some of countries maybe develop a team, but need some more efforts on the governance rules, responsibilities, communication line, and distribute the effort between the team in proper way, capacity building and capacity development. Networking is very important for the Ministry of Health to be, con to be connected with the HESP groups. This is the idea that University of Oslo working in all countries by or through HESP groups just to get update, knowledge, um, 
any new information. Uh, monitoring, planning, and evaluation of the effort. We cannot say, okay, we implemented. It's not something written in stone or something just implemented for one time forever. So every day we have an update. Uh, so we have to, to evaluate um, uh, you do, uh, um, frequently. A gradual scale up. It's not like a magic stick, the tracker, basically the tracker. Uh, okay, we cannot say, okay, in one day I will implement this. Uh, okay, it might take five years or, or seven years. To, to reach the national level, facility level, subnational level. So all these issues should be studied at the day one of the project and to make a realistic promise. Finally, uh, or before finally, research on data use. The research is one of the advocacy tool. In fact, when the academia or academic people are involved in the implementation process and get some information or some data for the uh, and utilize it in a proper way, push it for uh, policy intervention, policy enlightenment for policy and decision maker. It will be very helpful. And in that way, this country will be shining when it comes to the implementation of the, the DHIS2 and when, will open the appetite of the donors to chip and, and to come and to invest in that country. So this is one of the things that 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 help the country to invest more in the DHIS2. Finally, to have a clear roadmap and vision about the uh, what we need really from the DHIS2. What are the programs need to be converted into a tracker? Uh, as yani, it needs more planning, and the planning should be revised uh, and revisited every uh, um, period just to make sure that you have a robust tracker implementation solution. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Great. So as I said, we did our best. We saved some time for discussion. So we'd really love to hear from you in the audience. I'm gonna also pull up uh, the Zoom just so I can see if there were any comments. Okay. Um, yes, in fact, maybe I'll even invite the presenters to come up so they can see your shining faces and remember who they're talking to. Oh. So I, I can kick us off with a question and then open things up. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about uh, from the Maldives, the the planning. So you, you showed this very large uh, an ambitious uh, use of tracker. You've gone really quickly. Can you talk a little bit about what made this able to move so quickly? What were the enabling factors? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to highlight that uh, good governance and the prioritizing the which areas to be developed first was the uh, it was easy for us to develop these modules. And uh, for each module, actually, we had a core team designated for the contact development, and uh, we had a huge support from our WHO country office and other agencies in developing and uh, capacity building. So in the cancer registry event, uh, we first had a policy meeting, and we decided to, since we did not have a cancer registry in Maldives, and we were very much uh, using uh, paper-based and Excel sheets for the cancer surveillance, uh, that we we I need, and since we are not able to know the cancer numbers, that uh, this is really important for the country. So with that decision, we made a technical committee, and throughout the tech, uh, the technical committee was meeting throughout the development and in the training stage also to finalize the module. So for each module, the same uh, procedure goes on, and for that, it is very easy for us to finalize the module and go for the piloting. So I think that is the process that we followed. Great, thank you. Okay, looking towards the audience, are there questions? Questions for the panel as a whole, uh, questions for any individual?
Uh, yeah, this is a question for the Maldives. Uh, it's very, I agree with uh, what you presented. It was very impressive to see this modular approach and how well it could scale so quickly. My question is, how does that fit within the larger uh, digital structure of the other programs that the healthcare workers are using? Uh, does that make sense? For example, yeah. how does it fit with uh, additional EMRs or insurance? Uh, systems? Uh, actually, we, it's a challenge for Maldives uh, in integrating the uh, health insurance systems and the hospital-based uh, systems to the DHS2. But we are in discussion and working to integrate it. And uh, according to our HIMR team, we will be able to integrate two hospital systems to the DHS2. But uh, uh, I think I did not talk about the challenges, but it is a challenge in Maldives that we are facing right now. And uh, for the hosting also with uh, deploying of so many modules, uh, we are facing uh, difficulties in hosting and slowing of the modules also with the current implementation and use of these uh, different modules. But still we are working uh, to fix and integration of other systems to DHIS2. Okay, thank you for all the good presentation. So my question is more on the knowledge side about the DHS2 immunization tracker. I want to know, is it possible as it is now, and if not, how much effort would, it, would be needed to be able to track vaccine supply? So say at a health facility, we supply vaccines and in the end we need to know how many have been used, how many have been discarded. And so to have such kind of reports, is that possible? And if not, like I said, this is a knowledge question, how easy would that be to incorporate into the tracker? Thank you. So I don't I don't know if uh, either of your programs or have addressed the supply chain. Duzo, do you have an amazing answer for us? Yeah, it's not that really amazing, uh, but uh, <clears throat> for our context and specifically for Somalia, uh, we adopted the LMS package uh, to be able to uh, to be able to capture the status of the uh, of the commodity, including the uh, the vaccine. So it might not be really like uh, the really logistic management information system, but rather. Uh, knowing the status, like uh, uh, how many has been issued, uh, how many has been received, and the kind of that. So uh, through that, because uh, there was also during the implementation of the tracker, uh, that request also emerged. Like they wanted, like uh, uh, when the uh, <clears throat> uh, the healthcare worker is providing a service, uh, to be able to deduct, like for example, if you uh, you had like. Uh, Twenty uh, vials of BCG or whatever uh, vaccine that you are having. So, if two has been maybe issued or uh, or vials has been maybe uh, used, to deduct automatically from the uh, status that you are collecting. So, uh, we told them that was not possible for now. And I think uh, I have seen one of the uh, during the networking. There is also another organization advocating how they have managed it to. Uh, to really integrate the LMIs within the data. So it might be the something to learn and just be able to see how uh, does, uh, does that work. Yeah. And I was just going to mention, so we, for the last few years, we've had an initiative focused on how to use DHS2 for logistics. So we have a team that hopefully you can be in contact with if that's interest uh, of interest to you, Breno and George and Per, that are all here. Um, and they, there's a landing spot on the website as well to show you the use of DHS2 for logistics, which is really focused on the last mile. So they have used vaccines as one of the key use cases of, of what the capabilities are and how they can use them. They worked with the researcher and built a cold chain monitoring uh, application to feed into DHS2. So there's a number of things that you can learn from that. And uh, hopefully you can connect with them as well. Hi, uh, my question goes to Maldives. 
uh, as you have mentioned that you have so many systems deployed and I believe they are all hosted in their own premises. Uh, so my question is, are they talking to each other? If yes, then what, what standard do you follow? You mean the uh, one module to the other module? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, for example, uh, those who are actually registered in the PHC portal where there will be uh, risk behaviors for non-communicable diseases, whether he has diabetes, uh, hypertension, or any cardiovascular diseases, anything like that. And if the patient uh, is re uh, registered to the cancer registry, Actually, you'll be able to see if the patient, uh, we are actually registering to this DHS2 system only once. For example, if a baby is also registered in the immunization tracker and, and if, the if the baby has cancer, we'll be able to track and see the history in the immunization portal. So like that, it is actually linked to each other that uh, we'll be able to follow. And regarding the standards, uh, we have some uh, standards that we follow. Actually, uh, we cannot edit uh, patient data unless uh, it is uh, actually data modification or changes made can be made only to the hosting or to the uh, current, uh, the initial stage only. So those standards are followed, but you will be able to view uh, each uh, other module of the same patient. Yeah, like so that. that. That's clear. The The question is, uh, when you say that if one system can see the record into another system, is it accessing the application directly or all the system are pushing data somewhere centrally so everyone can access? Yeah, it should be in the yeah. Sorry, uh, so what she was actually saying is that uh, only see Yeah, this is for the, uh, the online people. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm from his Sri Lanka, so I'm uh, supporting the minister team uh, because it's a kind of a technical question uh, I will answer. So uh, basically what she mentioned is all these modules for different uh, domains, different programs, they are configured in one a single DHS to tracker instance. So uh, when, when she mentioned that uh, some of the data uh, which is captured in one program and for example, the attributes are visible to another health uh, worker if required is within the functionality of DHS too. So in DHS2, we can configure things like sharing settings. And I mean, there are some configurations. So using that, uh, you can enable that. Uh, so it's within. So there are no. And, and also just to also mention, because she mentioned about uh, integrating with hospital systems. So countries in the process of developing their digital health blueprint, which will define like what are the different architectures that they, go, that they want to follow uh, in moving forward. So I'm not saying again, like uh, uh, I think the ministry and the WHO, I mean, all the entire team is in the process of figuring out whether they are using fire or not or similar standard. Uh, but uh, at the moment, the plan is at least from the EMR uh, to push the aggregate data into DHS2 because that's where the HMIS is. At the moment, it's a kind of a manual pr pr process. But once the blueprint in, is implemented with the architecture, I think uh, we will have more clarity. Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Great. Looking around to see if there's any questions I can mention also as I walk towards the next question. Uh, the integration team here at the University of Oslo has been working for the last year and a half or so on uh, fire and the fire profiles and extending them to the tracker data model. Uh, that work has largely been based on guidance from the WHO, the digital adaptation kits. Um, and so we have several of those published around HIV case surveillance, around antenatal care. But in terms of the actual adoption or implementation of that, in most of the countries, FHIR hasn't yet become a standard for the systems we're connecting to. And so a huge part of our work also is in those kinds of environments, making sure that integration is possible. Um, so we have more, I think, that you'll see about that uh, a bit in the what's next session tomorrow uh, about the integration layer and the way that we can uh, transform data. But it's uh, always a very complicated and challenging process, but something that needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, my name is Anna, working at the HISP Center. Um, we know that implementing tracker systems uh, often can be challenging in terms of all the resources it takes to scale up 
the number of, and it doesn't really have to be tracker. It could be any individual based IT system. You have more end users. You have more devices that needs to be maintained over time. It's not enough to buy it at once. They need to be replaced maybe every three, four years. Nurses quit. New ones come in. Can you talk a little bit about your work or strategy or thoughts around how to keep the systems sustainable over time? It's a question to all of you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, as you said, uh, the implementation of Tracker, uh, once you have done implementing it, uh, it's really uh, not uh, realistic that it's going for, you're going to roll out for the whole country. There it has to be phased like approach. Uh, for example, for the Somalia, uh, once when we were implementing the ERA Tracker, uh, we started with the pilot. So there are a few facilities that we are selected. And uh, uh, WHO also, uh, in collaboration with the Minister of Health, uh, purchased some gadgets, uh, the tablets, uh, specifically for those facility to see how uh, it's really uh, working in terms of uh, uh, the time that uh, the healthcare workers are going to consume uh, capturing the record. Uh, after it has shown some uh, green light, then uh, they launched national like uh, the 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 the, uh, the ministry was invited to launch uh, like this is the uh, the tracker that the healthcare uh, the health facilities should use in terms of uh, uh, capturing those information so as of now i think uh, if i'm not mistaken uh, two two to three uh, districts you know regions has already adopted the tracker they're actually using it because uh, uh, it was really hard to have all of the gadgets bought at once because there are really uh, many. So there are actually once after this uh, uh, three to two uh, region uh, adopted the uh, the tracker, I think the plan is to now uh, scale up to the other states uh, because you know in in Somalia they are actually working in state uh, state approach uh, means. So uh, we started with the administrative uh, state uh, which is uh, Banadili. Uh, that's where the the pilot was uh, started, and now they are actually uh, extending to the other 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 states. So that was that has been the uh, phase like approach to make sure that uh, uh, at the end the whole country uh, they will be uh, using the uh, air track. So for those that you are, that are not using a tracker, they are still using a paper to actually be able to aggregate data, and then at the end of the month they have to key in in the into the DHS too. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, question quickly to the Maldives presenter. Are all these tracker implementations across all health facilities in the whole country? So the question about scale and where they'll be using these tracker systems you showed. Uh, okay, uh, I think in the presentation, uh, I have uh, mentioned that uh, actually the electronic immunization registry is now currently used throughout the country. But uh, our aim and our work is being done for uh, to roll out all these modules throughout the country but i think uh, we are only able to implement and currently use uh, eir module actually throughout the country yet but we are expanding the phc model slowly to rest of the islands and then the rest of the modules also i think we slowly it will be uh, used and implemented in throughout the country Thank you. I, I wanted to ask one last question because, Mohammed, you mentioned a couple of systems that were uh, quickly put into place following the, the, the needs from the war in Gaza. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the process is like to deploy something that quickly, how you had the requirements, uh, maybe something just about that. Thank you. Uh, maybe one of the, the, um, the benefit of the DHIS2 in the crisis and uh, uh, when it comes to response to the humanitarian issues, is to uh, utilizing the DHS2. In fact, we receive official uh, request from Ministry of Health in Egypt and UNICEF Egypt and Ministry of Health in Gaza as well, and some other UN agencies. We need to utilize the DHS2 because it's quick and easy to deal with, and uh, we need just you know, now. Uh, a quick solution to generate data, to capture data, to capture and to generate uh, an indicator in very quick way. We don't want to go for 
building a process or develop system from scratch since the DHI is too really is strong in this in this way. So that's why we we utilize the aggregate and we uh, utilize the a tracker and in fact we build it around, yani working around the hours and we build it in a few days because you know it's a war and it's very crisis uh, what happened in Gaza so uh, and this uh, yani within really within a few days the the, the systems were uh, up and functioning and running and the people trained uh, and fill the data uh, directly on the system thank you yes so one more time, a round of applause, I think, for our presenters. It's been really great stuffing. And please, if you have additional questions, uh, find them in the networking sessions. Thank you for attending.